Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 157 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we chat with herbalist Susan Belsinger all about growing ginger and turmeric. The plant profile is on eggplant and we share what's going on in the garden as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out the episode with a last word on mini meadow design by Graham Gardner, author of Tiny and Wild. This episode, we're joined by herbalist Susan Belsinger. She is a culinary educator, food writer, and photographer, and author of several books as well. Welcome, Susan. Hi there. I'm glad to be here. Great to have you. And you have been such a busy lady lately that we are lucky to have you on. Um, you were just coming off of the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival when I ran into you at the final days of that. So maybe we'll go in and talk a little bit about that festival. But first, on the Garden DC podcast, we like to ask our guests if they were born with chlorophyll in their veins and a green thumb, or did gardening come to you later in life? Well, I was born and raised in Baltimore in some red brick row houses, and we had a postage stamp backyard that led to a back alley where my hopscotch was. So we had grass, a maple tree, my mom had daylilies by the fence, and we had forsythia by the back wall. And that was pretty much nature for me when I was growing up, unless you went around front. And she had some low-growing conifers by the front porch, and she did have lilies of the valley under them and grass. So I had a push mower, <laughs> you know, the kind that just rolled around, mm -hmm. and it only took about 15 minutes to cut the lawn. So... It came much later in life to me when I uh, moved to Howard County is actually where I first started gardening. Hmm. And for those listeners outside of the mid-Atlantic U.S., Howard County is a suburb of Washington, D.C., but it's also a suburb of Baltimore, like kind of equidistant, I think, from both. Yeah, I'm really just about 50 minutes from Baltimore and 50 minutes from Washington, but it's rural. Mm -hmm. It's rural. It all used to be farmland out here. And of course, now there's developments, but we still have, you know, I have woods and a river and, you know, fields of wildflowers and things. So I, I am out here. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I know Howard County most for is the annual sheep and wool festival. Yes, that's a very popular event every year at the Howard County Fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so how did you get into herbalism? starting with that urban Baltimore background? Well, um, when I did, I moved to the Ho Howard County in the 11th grade, and uh, I, I still wasn't really into gardening. We had an acre, so we had a much bigger backyard. But I went to Europe and uh, North Africa, and in the Medina, in the Sook there, um, I went down streets full of herbs and spices, and I was astounded because I grew up in an Irish-German household, so my mom had dried parsley in a little McCormick can, and um, she had oregano and nutmeg. Those were her main things to use uh, in, in cooking uh, with spices and herbs. So I was really dumbfounded, overwhelmed. It was a sensory overload, and I wanted to know about uh, those things, so I went to the bathhouse on the woman's day in the little village I was staying in. And I met a woman who could speak Spanish and I asked her about the herbs and spices. And uh, she invited me to her home to meet with her mom, who was a cook, you know, and lo and behold, when I got there, every woman in town was in, in the house. <laughs> so they sort of took me under their wing and anytime they cooked something special, they invited me over to watch. And that's where I started. I bought a notebook and I started writing recipes with herbs and spices. So then from there, I went to Italy and um, 
I ended up living on a biodynamic farm there for about a year and we grew everything and going up the mountain, it was lined with bay trees that were 30 feet tall, you know, and we had rosemary hedges and sage and they grew basil. They were totally self-sufficient. Wow. That was like an extraordinary life-changing experience for me to learn how to grow things and live with season, you know, because we can buy anything we want year round here in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. But in Europe, you really eat by the seasons. Hmm. So that was the early 70s. And so I've been doing this now for 50 years, um, writing recipes, growing herbs. And, uh, you know, it's a way of life for me. Hmm. That immersion must have been so wonderful. And what part of Italy was that in? Um, I was 14 kilometers outside of Florence in the Tuscan Hills. Wow. Paradise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're back in Howard County when you came back to the U.S. And mm -hmm. did you start um, writing and teaching about herbs right away? Or how did you make that transition of being an educator about herbs? So uh, when I lived in Italy, I met a woman there who was from California named Carolyn Dilly. And Carolyn and I hit it off. And uh, so we cooked and gardened a lot together when we were over there. And when we were both returning to the United States after over a year there, uh, we decided that we wanted to educate Americans about herbs. And we didn't quite know how to go about it. Um, but I went out to California and we wrote an article on parsley. We made 12 recipes with parsley and took photographs that were not professional at all. And um, back then there were two cooking magazines. There was Gourmet and Bon Appetit. And we sent off a, a letter with all the recipes and all the photos, which is not something you would do nowadays. Uh, and we said, um, we want to teach Americans about cooking with fresh herbs. So Bon Appetit wrote back and said they weren't interested. And Gourmet wrote back, uh, they actually called us and said, we are interested. However, you know, this is just parsley. We need to see a few other herbs. And so we were growing basil and it was spring in California. So we went and got a, I mean, they didn't have herbs in the grocery store. So we went to the the big market, the warehouse market, and we got a, a whole crate of dill. And so we quick made some recipes and sent them. And it was totally beginner's luck that Gourmet decided to publish us for a whole year. And it was called A Calendar of Herbs. And we wrote it in 1979. And they published an herb of the month for the year um, for 1980. And that was the basis for our first cookbook, which was Cooking with Herbs, that was published in 1981. And we added eight more um, herbs. So it was 20 main culinary herbs was the first book. Mm, how wonderful. And so you're coming at it from a culinary herb standpoint when you first started. Definitely. And uh, Carolyn and I continued on to write uh, seven books together. And, you know, I've, I've written a number of books with other people and by myself. And because, you know, you, you have these herbs and you go, what do I do with them? That's the question that more people ask me than anything else. I grow herbs, but I don't know what to do with them. And so that's what I love to teach people is how to capture the essence. So you have them year round. Um, and so from there, because I had all these herbs, of course, I wanted to use them to heal myself and my family. So I went off into the medicinal realm, which of course includes aromatherapy. Uh, and so um, I expanded my horizons and I continue to do so daily. Hmm. And so when I caught up with you at the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival, which is in early July every year, except for the years that COVID skipped, um, that takes place on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., and they always focus on a different culture or topic, um, and you were part of the Ozarks culture this time. So, um, yeah, it, they the region was the Ozarks, which includes five states that surround the Ozark Mountains, and the reason that I was involved is that in 19... 96, I went to speak at the Ozark Folk Center. I was invited by herbalist and head gardener there, Tina Marie Wilcox. 
And um, I went there and I fell in love with the Ozark Folk Center and the people all around there. There's a sense of community in the hills there that we don't have in big cities here. And um, it's absolutely gorgeous. There's rivers and all kinds of uh, wonderful things to forage. And so I've been going to the Ozarks every year since. And I teach folk school there twice a year. And um, I do medicinal herb seminars and uh, foraging hikes into the wilderness. And so I have dear friends. It's it's my second home there. And I was sort of a liaison for uh, the Ozarks living in outside of D.C. Um, we probably dug about uh, half the plants in the teaching and vegetable garden from my property here wow. and potted them up uh, back in March and April. And then, uh, you know, when the poke was only a foot high, <laughs> you know, and and we dug everything up from dandelions to plantain and violets. We dug weeds because we wanted to show them those things, too. And then um, we took a truckload to the Smithsonian facility and they kept those things alive and, you know, planted them up into bigger pots as the season went on so that the poke was six feet tall and it had berries and blooms on it for the teaching garden, which was really fun that we could work it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was quite impressive. The The garden is a temporary one and it's in, you know, one of the worst weeks as far as heat and humidity um, to be out on the National Mall and you're out there kind of in the open, a little bit under some of the side trees, right? And you have some tents for protection, but otherwise you're kind of just out there and so are the plants. Yes, and it was it was really, really hot. It was like hot soup. And then we did get evacuated to museums a number of times when there were rainstorms. So mm -hmm. the plants, um, when we got there, the vegetable garden was a platform and then they built the sides. And so we put everything in pots to make it look like a garden and then raised it up on a lot of straw um, so that they would be the height of the garden. And then uh, we were fortunate to get a lot of zoodoo, uh, which had great elephant balls in it. Um, <laughs> it was really uh, fun to have that because elephants, if you think about it, they have a, a poop that looks like deer poop or rabbit poop, only much bigger. <laughs> so we got to handle a lot of zoodoo um, and we put that on the pots to feed them while they were there. And then once we got everything sort of situated, we covered everything with leaf mulch. And uh, we actually brought bucket, one of our uh, volunteers brought buckets of leaves so we could make the woodland forest. You know, we spread leaves and we spread mulch, uh, we spread moss and things like that. We brought mossy rocks that we kept watered and to make it, you know, so we had a woodland and we had a meadow. And we had a waterfall. They brought a ton of limestone rocks to build the waterfall. So it was it was really an enormous feat. And it was much bigger than I anticipated. <laughs> but we pulled it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed that, especially the waterfall. I thought that was very evocative of a mountain stream. So that kind of placed you there in the Ozarks. And it kind of made the, a placemaking element that was really nice there. Um, so how was the interaction with the general public there? Did they ask a lot about your herbs or culinary or medicinal uses? So people, uh, you know, I would ask people, the visitors, where they were from, and they would ask me, you know, where I was, from, where I lived. And everyone was always surprised that I, you know, because it was an Ozark event that I was from Maryland. So I talked to them a lot about how here we are up in Maryland, D.C. area. And if you go really south and then some bit west, once you get down there, Arkansas, where I go, is a thousand miles away. But we're both zone seven. The zones drop down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are many very similar plants. Of course, they have plants that we don't have, but many of the plants were the same. And so the visitors who came into our herbalism tent they were intrigued by the display with ginger and turmeric. 
which are tropicals, which don't grow in the Ozarks unless you, you know, plant them in a greenhouse or and keep them under cover. But um, in in the vegetable garden, we kept all of the weeds at one end, you know. So we had burdock and we had tall mullen that was in bloom, and um, we had a lot of lambs quarters and perilla, you know, garden weeds, and. People probably ask me, I mean, of course they asked about the three sisters because we had the corn and the squash and the beans and you know, we had tomatoes and a lot of basil and all kinds of herbs in there, but they loved that poke and that mullen. People were intrigued by that. And probably I got asked more about the weeds than about the vegetables. Mm, that makes sense to me because that would be something that they would come across maybe in their own yard you know, that they see growing on the side of the road and they're like, wait, there's a use for this or I can actually make something out of this. And so I did. Um, one of the programs I did was called uh, Garden Sass, Goodness Gracious, Great Gobs of Greens. And so I harvested the greens, you know, and the lamb's quarters and the violet leaves. And and um, and we also... Uh, used collard greens because of course collard greens are the most famous green in the south but i put a lot of the foraged herbs in with them and uh wilted them down with you know onions and garlic and um, some olive oil and some hot red pepper vinegar we sprinkled on it that was one of the cooking dems that i did because uh, it was great to be able to go to the garden and be able to harvest things and show people on stage and you know we were out in the garden when we weren't on uh the teaching stage and showing people how to harvest things and telling them what they taste like and you know how to safely identify your wild weeds and so because a lot of those plants were dug from your garden this spring did those go back to your garden or what happened to them after the festival so um i took a lot of the vegetables back i sent things like the burdock, the nettles, and uh, some plants back on the truck to Arkansas for folks who didn't have those in their yard. Uh, the gardeners from the Smithsonian came and got, there were like 20 or 30 jewelry plants because they wanted to put it near uh, in a damp water feature that they had on the mall. And so I did leave behind things like the plantain and the dandelions because I have plenty of them. <laughs> and uh, so we did leave things and volunteers were in, invited to come and take plants and invite their, you know, their garden club friends or their whomever who might want plants. So I'm hoping they went to a good home. But no, I did not bring home that big old poke because I would have had to dug a really big hole and I got poke all around. So. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it maybe it went to a good home and maybe it became compost. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Probably. So let's talk a little bit about your home garden and what you grow. So I'm imagining that you're growing a lot for the classes you're giving. Yeah, um, I have a, a the gar vegetable gardens about a hundred foot by a hundred foot, and um, so I have. You know, uh, of course, I have a row of tomatoes <laughs> because I can't live all summer without tomato. I make a tomato sandwich every day in the summer. I, I love tomato sandwiches. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a row of hot peppers. And in in the spring, you know, I start with a, row, a couple rows of salad greens. And actually, right now, my kale is, I cut it back earlier in the season. So it's flourishing again. Um, and I have a row of potatoes and a row of onions and a row of garlic, you know, so uh, I have all the typical things. And then I have a really big row with all of the cucurbits in it, you know, so I have a huge climbing cage that has about eight cucumbers on it. And, and that row has zucchini and yellow squash and winter squash uh, and watermelons. So uh, I I put my annual herbs like basil and dill the parsley's out there even though that's a biennial i i put my cilantro uh so the the green growing annual herbs are out in the vegetable garden growing in the loamy soil 
you know, having had this garden for 40 years, and of course it was woods and then that was cleared off and then it was clay. Hmm. So we've been working this soil for many, many years. So it's lovely. It's, it's very nice soil. We, you know, feed it every year. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a good rich soil. And then around front of the house, of course, the whole perimeter of the house has plants growing around it and they're, you know, they've been there for some of them 30 to 40 years. So, you know, I have azaleas and, um, you know, clumps of all kinds of perennials and things like that. Um, and then I have sort of a wild garden out front that has a lot of monarda and phlox. It's, so it's my pollinator garden. It's got Joe pie weed and it's got a lot of milkweed for the butterflies and it's got a, a red bud and an elderberry, you know, so that's sort of my, my wild pollinator garden and it's unkempt, it's weedy. <laughs> and then I have a bed that is, I call it my med bed and it's my um, Mediterranean herb bed. And the reason I have the Mediterranean herbs in another garden entirely is because Mediterranean herbs don't want really rich, loamy soil and they don't mm -hmm. want clay. What they want is really good drainage. So that bed has rock phosphate, it has granite, it has potash, it's got sand, um, it's got a lot of chicken grit you know, which is calcium from oyster shells. Uh, it's got lava rock and it's got stones. And it gives me the sharp drainage that the woody perennials like uh, sage, rosemary, thyme, lavender, savory, those plants need and want. Those plants are not going to do well in loam and they're not going to do, you know, well in clay. So you've got to give them what they want. And that's sharp drainage and they get hot sun. So um, they're pretty happy out there in that med bed. Excellent. So this is probably a good time to transition to the topic of the hour, which is growing ginger and using it and all the wonderful things about it. So I chose ginger of all the herbs we can discuss, Susan, because that's the one that most of my readers and listeners ask me about because they have such a hard time, but they want it. <laughs> so, um, And they seem to have more luck with some of the others, the Mediterranean ones and the annual ones that you talked about. So maybe let's start from the beginning. Um, so ginger is a tropical plant and um, how would you recommend somebody who is in the mid-Atlantic area, zone six, seven, uh, being able to grow it and use it? So um, I went out to visit my kids who live in Oregon and they have an organic farm and it's called Harbinger Farm. And uh, last year they grew a um, hundred foot row of ginger. It, under cover. It was a hoop house. So mm -hmm. they rolled up the sides, but it did give it a little bit of shade from the really hot sun and or the rain. And I just happened to be there just about a month before the big ginger harvest. And so I was able to experience ginger plants where they had planted a finger of ginger, you know, the, the whole big clump of ginger is referred to as a hand and you break off a finger and plant it. And they were harvesting very large hands and they were bright pink because fresh ginger is very different than what we buy in the grocery store with the dried brown skin. Mm -hmm. You don't have to peel it. Um, it's juicy and moist and it has a lot less of those fibrous hairs in it. Um, and it's, it's something remarkable and you don't get this ginger unless you grow it. So, so I was just lucky that that happened the year before ginger was herb of the year. And so I came home and I planted fingers of ginger. You know, I did a whole flat in pots. And if you don't get your ginger from an organic grower, then, and you just buy ginger at the grocery store or the Asian market, 
it's often got a growth inhibitor sprayed on it so it doesn't sprout. Mm -hmm. So if you want to use that, it's perfectly fine to do so, but you need to put it in water overnight to get remove that growth inhibitor. And it really does work. And I've had people say to me, my ginger just didn't sprout and, and that is the reason. So ginger doesn't sprout quickly. Um, and and so what, what I started my ginger was in about March and um, I did a flat of it. And I also did a flat of turmeric too, um, which, you know, they're both members of the Zingabraceae family and mm-hmm. they're both rhizomes and they really grow similarly. They have the same growing needs. However, turmeric takes a lot longer to germinate than the ginger. It was what I have found. Hmm. So um, I planted them in a soil medium, um, part something like a uh, pro mix, and then I use hummus or compost. Um, so it would be nourished at the same time. And, uh, I did, oh, I guess they were four inch pots, you know, so I could lay the ginger on its side and you want to plant it about an inch or so deep, put about an inch of soil on top of it. And then you need to keep it watered well, uh, when you want it to sprout because the dried skin, you know, they have to swell the rhizomes. And so what happens is, uh, it doesn't really want to sprout until it's hot because it's tropical. Uh, and I had it on a heat mat in my greenhouse, but if you didn't have a heat mat and a greenhouse, then probably you're going to want to plant it in about April so that once it turns warm in May and June, it's going to sprout for you. Mm-hmm. And mine is all outside now. I I did over plant. I have a lot of different kinds of ginger. I have some ornamentals and I have two or three kinds of uh, different organic ginger. Uh, it's, it's Zingabera officinalis, but I they're from different sources. You know, some is from Hawaii and some is uh, local, is from Maryland. And then I had some of Lucy and Matt's ginger from Oregon. And so once it sprouts, it grows quickly then, and you get a green stem, you know, with leaves. Turmeric leaves are bigger than ginger ones. And what you have to do is you have to, because it's growing, you have to pot, go up to the next size pot and even a third size pot during the growing season, unless you put it in the garden. So mine, I would say... I planted about 70% of my ginger out in the garden because I'm going to get bigger hands because it's in free soil rather than being in a pot where it can only get as as big as the pot, so to speak. I call um, anything, whether it's an herb or ginger or turmeric growing in a pot, that I'm growing it in captivity (laughs) because indeed I am. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So they don't get as big in pots, but don't be discouraged if that's all you have. Grow it in pots for certain, because one finger is going to be a hand by the end of the growing season. So the life of for a ginger uh, rhizome is about nine to ten months, because once it gets cold and your foliage starts to turn yellow, which is inevitable because it's tropical it turns yellow and sort of flops over. Think of what garlic does. You know, it turns yellow when it's ripe. Um, Then it's time to lift the ginger. And what I do then is I lift it and um, I process it. I do everything from making homemade pickled ginger, which is such a divine thing to have on hand. And I do that by the quart load. Um, I freeze it I make ginger syrup. I slice it and dry it in my dehydrator so I can grind it. Um, But I save fingers and lay them in pots. And uh, that's early in the season and they're not going to really sprout. But I lay them in pots so that I can, I only water them about once a month in the wintertime. And then when I'm 
want them to start sprouting in the spring, then I start to water them regularly so that they swell up. But I, I keep them, you know, in the soil so that they're going to sprout for me the next season. So I'm keeping, you know, a continuation of these rhizomes. Hmm. And the ones that are in pots, are you keeping them in a sunny winter windowsill or are you keeping them somewhere else? So I am keeping them in my greenhouse and my greenhouse is the south side of my house. Um, and we heat, it's a passive solar house and we heat by wood. So in the winter time, the greenhouse can easily be 45 degrees. It's mm -hmm. not heated. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they're, they're not going to sprout at that, you know, they're going to sit there. And so you don't want to overwater them because they'll rot. Um, so I do keep them. A lot of them are on the floor. They're not up on the potting bench. And then when it's starting to get spring and the sun is shining, then I'm going to lift them up, put them on the potting bench and start watering them. Hmm. And yeah, I've seen some local farmers who are starting to grow ginger and turmeric, and they're doing the same thing that your son was doing, which is having them in hoop houses, which just have basically the shade cloth above, planting them directly in the soil in rows, and then I guess harvesting towards the end of maybe September, October, that period, and then harvesting maybe a few, a few from the market as they go. Um, and then I'm imagining they're not letting them winter over in that hoop house. They're going to pull all the rest. It sells like hot cakes. You mm -hmm. would not believe it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so wonderful. You know, people just go for it. So uh, when I was there, the end of August is we pulled, you know, we dug a few and uh, they needed a little more growth time, but they were still delicious, even though we dug them a little early. So they really started their harvest at about the end of September. And so growing them under that cover gives them a much longer growing season. And, you know, they get, they get much bigger being in the, hilled up in the earth like that. And um, they, they fertilize regularly. And I fertilize uh, with fish emulsion, you know, um, they, they are feeders. They, you know, to make them get bigger, you do need to, to fertilize them. But, you know, I would not discourage someone who really wants to try it to go get one now. You're not going to get a, a huge yield this year, mm -hmm. but you would, you can start and see how it works, you know. Mm -hmm. And especially, I would think if you're not going to get it from a grocery store or from a seed catalog, but you could go to a local farmer's market and just get a small piece um, yes. of, of a tuber and mm -hmm. start with that and, and maybe even have it as a patio plant or a house plant. Yes. Uh-huh. And where you can, you know, keep an eye on it, keep it warmish, you know, in a, in a good place. And then, you know, if you're going to keep it like that, bring it in, you can bring it indoors in the fall and it'll give it a little bit longer, uh, life before it's going to turn yellow and, you know, need to be harvested. And I have left ginger in pots, uh, not harvested, and it comes back year after year. I, I have one in with a jade plant, and it's a huge old jade plant, and that ginger comes up and grows through the jade, and I've never harvested it, but it's probably been in there for five years with the jade, and it still germinates and uh, sends up new growth every year. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I planted uh, about five of them along the wall, the foundation of my house last year. And apparently I missed one. And even though we had a freezing cold winter, it, it's really close to the foundation. It came back up, mm. which I found to be amazing. I, I, I'm not sure how it lived through the winter here, but uh, there's this one lonely <laughs> ginger out there by the foundation. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about that and experimenting because the hardiness zone is officially uh, 9 to, I think, up, up to 12, which I don't even know anybody who lives in a 12, but, you know, good mm -hmm. luck for you, <laughs> for you. But with zone pushing, and like you said, against a south-facing wall, maybe a foundation, maybe some extra mulching, keep it over that, and a mild winter, I think we can probably push it and leave some of those in the ground. Right. And so, you know, if, if it froze 
and mm -hmm. dried and then spring came and it got wet again and it sprouted. Mm. So it's, it's out there. And I, I, I'm not sure whether I want to dig it up or let it stay, <laughs> but I do have to tell you one exciting thing about turmeric, which some of my turmeric took over two months to germ mm. to send out sprouts. And I was getting ready to uh, write to the, the grower and say, Hey, you gave me bad turmeric, but it, one of them sprouted. And then I was like, yes. So I bought a blue turmeric from Baker Creek and I, when it came, I had to cut it open and it's turquoise blue and lime green inside. Whoa. It's not that bright orange yellow. Mm -hmm. And, um, those, I bought a pound, which was $45, which is a lot of money for a pound of turmeric. And I split it with a, a friend of mine. And so I probably got nine or 10 pots with the fingers that I had. And, and it took, you know, over two months to germinate. But now the leaves that they've sent up, which are very big, they're green and the whole center of them are dark royal purple. Wow, sounds beautiful. And do you ever get flowering on the gingers or turmerics that you're growing? Uh, I do have flowering gingers. And yes, they, they, they do send up flowers. Um, and I keep them in pots pretty much. They're not in the ground. Um, and, uh, I have had a couple flower, but mostly, no, I mostly don't get flowers hmm. uh, on the, on the ornamental ones. Yes. But on the ones that I'm digging up for the garden, for the root, you know, to eat, to save it, I, I really don't, I haven't really gotten flowers on them. Hmm. Yeah. Because I was wondering, you know, you're eating the ginger root, but whether other parts of the plant, the leaves and the flowers were also edible. Um, the leaves really aren't used uh, too much, although I do a, a, a ginger syrup. I have a ginger elixir that is quite divine and you can mix that with sparkling water and make a mocktail or, you know, add rum or whatever and make a cocktail. And uh, we did that in a big punch bowl. So I used the green foliage of the ginger, you know, in the punch bowl as garnish and to stir it. Uh, but I don't, you don't really eat the leaf, although the leaf has a smell. Turmeric leaves have more of a smell than the ginger leaves do, you know, so, but I don't eat that, but the flowers are edible. Hmm. Yeah. And they're so beautiful too. And where I've seen them grown ornamentally really in Atlanta, you know, and South of there, they're just right. a beautiful addition to the garden and they're just growing them, you know, in the ground coming back year after year. Yes. And in fact, um, my friend Art Tucker, uh, he had a large patch of ornamental ginger alongside of his garage. Uh, it was somewhat protected and his came back every year and it, it was taller than me. It was six foot tall and it bloomed. So uh, it can be done. It, depending upon the location and, you know, pushing the envelope. But I have a friend in Florida and her, some of her flowering gingers are in the ginger herb of the yearbook and they're just amazing blooms. They're absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we should mention, of course, that that's from the International Herb Association named ginger herb of the year for 2023. Yes. I, iherb.org is, is the website and you can go read about it or order the book. And I will, I will give you the heads up that Yarrow is Herb of the Year next year. Ooh, we love Yarrow. <laughs> we I grow, do too. grow lots of that. Super easy to grow. Um, so for ginger, we should probably talk about it has medicinal value um, and some of those uses in nutritional. And then maybe let's um, finish up with some of the culinary ways we can prepare it. And it's one of our oldest uses of herbs i think out there um you know definitely several thousands of years ago there's evidence of ginger being used um so let's talk about how it's used medicinally yes it it definitely has thousands of years of use and it's used in traditional chinese medicine um so i would say out of most of the herbs that i know and grow that ginger is a powerhouse culinarily and medicinally. It's one of the most wonderful of all of the herbs. 
and um, it's good for so many parts of the body. Of course, we know that it's good for digestion. Um, it's great for gut health. And basically, it's good for every kind of stomach upset or intestinal problem and every kind of nausea, whether it's morning sickness or motion sickness or even um, they're using it a lot now in helping to treat chemo chemotherapy patients. So um, probably I can't think of anything better for your stomach. I mean, you know, we even used to do when I was a little kid, we did ginger ale for an upset stomach, mm -hmm. you know. And it is also um, really good for uh, women's health, um, especially women who tend to be cold or have delayed or scanty menstruation. Uh, it helps with that because it's stimulating and warming. Um, and it helps with a healthy flow of menses. And it's as easy as, you know, slicing some ginger root and making a decoction you know, just drinking a cup of the tea, but you can also use powdered ginger and, and add it to things. Mm -hmm. um, it's also very good for migraine headaches. And um, it basically is a vascular, it, it opens the system. So it helps for blood dispersion. And in the same case, it's great for circulation. It's warming and stimulating. And um, it, it helps your blood to circulate throughout your system. But to get to those extremities that, you know, like cold feet, cold hands. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very warming. And I do use it topically in, in oil. I make a, a, a joint ease oil for uh, arthritis. And it really helps me with that. But I also put it in the tub for warming situations so you can uh, rub it on your body you can drink it not you know you're not going to rub it on your body straight if you're using a ginger essential oil you have to dilute it in a, mm -hmm. a carrier oil um, so it's uh, really wonderful for that and um, again for for being cold and best of all for seasonal ailments i mean you know ginger is going to knock a cold or a flu out and it's great for any respiratory kind of problem. Um, and it helps, you know, it makes you sweat. Uh, so that's going to also help get toxins out of your body through your skin. Um, and I'll tell you what, when I had COVID, I made ginger decoction and drank it every day throughout the day and really it alleviated its symptoms. It, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure it helped my duration to be much less. Mm. Uh, so I pretty much keep a decoction of ginger root in my refrigerator and I can drink it with no sweetener or anything, but most people like to sweeten it with a little honey and maybe put a little slice of lemon juice in it. It, it goes so well with lemon. Um, but you know, I'm working on inflammation in my body, uh, because I do have arthritis and taking that ginger decoction and using it in an oil on my joints and putting it in the tub, I, I love to take baths, has alleviated my symptoms enormously. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear. And I was going to say, I'm glad you mentioned sweetening it because I love candy ginger, especially for mm. motion sickness. Like if I'm mm -hmm. going to be on a long flight, I'll always bring some of that. I'll get that usually at an Asian market um, and have that in my pocket to bring along or those, uh, now ginger candies they have in the little wrappers. Right. Those, those work well too. Yes. I always carry them on an airplane or on a car trip. They're, they're wonderful. And, uh, I also, I make elderberry shrub and elderberry syrup because it's an immunostimulant, but I've been adding ginger root to those. Hmm. So I'm getting the double whammy of, of, uh, good health for, flus, you know, the winter season, sore throats. And to be honest, um, one of the, the singers at uh, the uh, Folk Life Festival lost his voice and they came to me and they said, what can we do? So I gave him the shrub with uh, 
the ginger and the elderberry, and I added a little of my hot pepper shrub. I make a fatali shrub. So a shrub is, you know, made from apple cider vinegar and honey. And uh, they came back the next day and said, he needs more. But he was <laughs> able to go on stage and sing. And Good. then I started having people winding up in the morning saying, oh, you know, the smoke in D.C. made my asthma act up. And, oh, <laughs> I've got a toothache. And I'm like, wait, I'm not the village herbalist. But, you know, I had all those things in you know, for show and tell in the tent. And um, so they work. These okay. things work, you know. I I just think that I'm dependent on ginger as a medicine. Mm-hmm. I'm, I use it a lot. And mm-hmm. I really am dependent on ginger as a food. Um, you know, so I, I cook with it in savory and sweet dishes. And I, I drink a lot of it and I make a ginger syrup. Um, and that uh, ginger syrup I add a vanilla bean to mellow it out. So it's really turns into an elixir and some lemon or lime. And it, it makes the most divine ginger ale that you, you ever want to drink. <laughs> Sounds good. So I keep that in the refrigerator and I keep it in the freezer. Um, I freeze a lot of syrups, so you know re- they don't last in the refrigerator for more than a couple of weeks. Then they get a cloudy, mothery looking thing in in those syrups. So I freeze a lot of them. But you know when you make syrups from all these different herbs and roots, and uh, you know I put them in mason jars, and you got to leave a good inch head space because they expand when they freeze. You absolutely must label them because mm-hmm. when you take the lid off and smell a frozen syrup. You can't tell what it is. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Good tip. And yeah, I think that's so wonderful. And then you pointed out that ginger is both a great uh, culinary herb for both savory and sweet. And of course, everybody's familiar at Christmas time um, and the holidays with use of gingerbread. And sometimes we don't even equate the ginger root itself with gingerbread. I think it's like so disassociated sometimes from people because they just get their ginger you know, from a little spice jar in the spice aisle at the, at the grocery store. Right. And, and while that is effective culinarily and medicinally, it's not anything like fresh ginger or the candy ginger. So when I make gingerbread, it's triple gingerbread. It's got powdered, it's got fresh grated root and candy chunks. I go all out make it really gingery. And I, I do cookies the same way when I do ginger snaps. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting a real dose of it and, uh, it's they're healthy cookies and gingerbread. Yeah. You can eat extra because it's healthy for you. Right, Susan? <laughs> exactly. <right. laughs> and I think the same way about ginger beer and ginger ale. I'm a big fan of ginger beer. Um, which is basically a stronger version of ginger ale. And sometimes people will have it as a fermented drink as well. Another step further in ginger beer. Yes. And and that's a great thing to do is to ferment it. Um, you know, of course, that's even better for your gut health, you know, to have a fermented beverage like that. Um, but one of the things that I I really love to do the most with ginger is slice it paper thin and um, make pickled ginger. So basically you're using rice wine vinegar, a little apple cider vinegar, water. Um, You can add garlic if you want. It's got salt and it usually has some sugar in it. And then I use the red shiso perilla leaves from the garden. And that's what makes pickled ginger pink is by, because they add the shiso leaves. Uh, And I do many quarts of it because I can just go to the fridge when I need to pick me up and, and take a couple slices of that. It's making me slobber right now. I do <laughs> um, because it's so good and mm. it can be added to so many things, you know, to stir fries and to dips and vinaigrettes and marinades. Um, so you really can't have too much of it on hand. And, you know, once you give it as a gift and everybody wants it, uh, you know, they bring their jar back empty <laughs> for mm-hmm. more. So I tend to put up a lot of pickled ginger uh, Mm. that way. And to get that super paper thin slicing, are you using a mandolin? Yes. There's Mm. no other way of getting it so paper thin. Mm -hmm. And you want it to be thin, you know, because you have, 
you want it to be like pliable to put on sushi. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want a big thick slice that is chewy and dense. You want the light, light thin one and it pickles really well that way. Mm, does sound wonderful. Yeah. And I would, who wouldn't want that as a hostess gift? I would love that too. That's wonderful. And so how can our listeners get in contact with you and find out more? Well, my website is www.susanbelsinger.com. Um, and I do social media. Uh, I'm on Facebook under Susan Belsinger. I post when I'm getting ready to do events somewhere. Um, I don't just post regularly on there. I probably post more on Instagram. And my Instagram is uh, name is Cooking with Herbs, and there's no G on cooking. Cooking with Herbs. And we should also point out that Belsinger has one L. So B E L S I N G E R. And we'll have a link to that in the episode show notes as well. And I, I found your uh, ginger syrup award winning recipe that's also on your website, and we'll, we'll link to that as well. Okay, great. Uh, I'm happy to share that. Everybody should be able to make that. You should all do it as soon as possible. <laughs> it's it's great to drink as a mocktail, but I I totally love it with a shot of rum and this fizzy water, and it makes a great cocktail. The slice mm -hmm. of lime is lovely and refreshing. Um, and then, of course, it's going to be delicious on any fruit. I was laying in bed last night thinking about ginger and peaches mm -hmm. and uh it would be it would be lovely a little of that syrup on there and i've been experimenting lately i infused a few pieces of ginger root in whipping cream and strained it out and added some maple syrup and oh my gosh you put that on your peaches or your gingerbread it's it's like it's very delicious you'll have to try it Wow. It sounds like a perfect summer refreshment, especially that uh, little cocktail infusion there. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's good. And there's, you know, there's so many ways to use it. Um, you know, I just love to put ginger with um, miso or tamari soy sauce and a little rice wine vinegar and mirin. And you've got a marinade or you've got it's so divine. That's so simple. All you do is mash up some cucumbers and slice them and put that over them with a little grated ginger. And uh, it's a divine, very quick, you know, summer vegetable. And mm. uh, it just goes very well in, in stir fries and things like that, too. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, Susan, for sharing all about growing ginger and its many culinary uses. You're welcome, Kathy. I, it was a pleasure, and I'll come back again if you want. Definitely. I think when you talked about that elderberry syrup, that made me remember how much I love elderberries, and we'll definitely have you back on to talk about those. Okie doke. Eggplant Plant Profile Eggplant is an annual plant that produces edible fruits. It is perennial in USDA zones 10 through 12. Eggplants originated in India and are also known as aubergine. Eggplant fruits are commonly purple or white and can be egg-shaped, long and slender, or short and fat. Most gardeners in our region start their plants by seeds in March or purchase started seedlings in order to get a head start on the growing season. The seedlings can be planted outside once the soil is warm enough in very late spring. The plant has pretty lilac flowers and large leaves. Don't be surprised if those leaves become riddled with small holes. They are caused by the flea beetle. To help prevent that damage, protect your eggplants with a row cover until the plants start to flower. Like its cousin in the nightshade family, tomatoes and peppers, the eggplant will need staking and fertilizing as the heavy fruits start to form on it. Harvest the fruits when the skin is glossy and taut by cutting it off the stem with a sharp knife. Prepare and eat it right away as eggplants can turn bitter if left too long on the plant 
or not consumed while fresh. Eggplant, you can grow that. What's new this week? Well, over at the community garden plot, we have our first zucchini and first zinnia blooms. Everything is really popping along now that the summer heat and steady rains have come in. At my home garden, the rubecchia is blooming along with coneflower and the first of the golden rods are opening. I wanna say thank you to our latest listener supporter, Benjamin Proshek. Benjamin, it's listeners like you who make this podcast possible. Thank you again for being our latest listener supporter. The July 2023 issue of Washington Gardener magazine has just been posted, and you can check that out at washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Inside, you'll find features including our bird column about how to attract ruby-throated hummingbirds to your garden, a day trip to Zinnia Restaurant, which many of you may have known as Mrs. K's Toll House. Our edible column is on heirloom cucumbers. Our insect column is on daylily thrips. We have a plant profile on bronze fennel, a feature on the founder of gardening and beets, lots of garden tips and tricks to share, and much more in this issue. In the world of local gardening events, a few that you might want to attend include Vegetables for Fall and Winter Harvest taking place on Wednesday, August 2nd at 7 p.m. in Arlington at the Arlington Central Library. And this is Arlington, Virginia, of course. And um, this is a free in-person talk. No registration is required. Uh, it's put on by the Friends of Urban Agriculture and the Master Gardeners at Arlington Central Library. And following that, you can attend on Friday, August 4th, an online talk, Battling Bugs at the U.S. Botanic Garden. That's at 12 noon, held virtually online. You can register for that at usbg.gov. And that talks all about how the U.S. Botanic Garden deals with insect pests through their integrated pest management program. And coming up in August on Saturday the 12th at 9.30 a.m., Art in the Garden at tutorplace.org. You can attend a colored pencil sketching workshop in the garden. Participants explore summer flora incorporating brilliant hues and with hatching, cross-hatching, and subtraction techniques. All materials are provided. The fees are $45 for members and non-members $55. And again, that's tutorplace.org for signing up for that. And then Washington Gardener Magazine's Tomato Tasting. I want you to add that to your calendar. That's taking place Saturday, August 26th at the Fresh Farm Market in downtown Silver Spring, Maryland for a celebration of everything tomato and that's free and open to all from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Happy gardening! Get low maintenance alternative salons with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jets. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer-resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, 
Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen, Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. This is the last word on mini meadow design by Graham Gardner, author of Tiny and Wild, Build a Small-Scale Meadow Anywhere. When the book came out, I found myself in Puerto Rico, looking for ways to integrate my 25 years of naturalistic landscape design in the United States with the microclimates and landscapes of the tropics. It has been a dream of mine to one day have a flower farm to provide organic, local, long-lasting cut flowers. As I now have access to land on a friend's farm, I am beginning to integrate the techniques in the book to a boots on the ground project here in San Salvador Carguas. First, I've begun to clear areas for test plots in full sun. I've weed boxed the existing pasture grasses to the ground, careful to leave clumps of desirable grasses and grass-like plants. I've then added sailcloths to solarize the areas I intend to till. Normally, I would not recommend disturbing the seed bank in the soil or soil structure. However, this farm used to have cattle. The soil is compacted and the pasture grasses have deep established roots. A one-time till will loosen the top six inches and help me to remove the existing grasses and make room for new plants. I've also created plant lists using some of my favorite species from the final chapter of the book, as well as those species I have seen at other farms here growing successfully. I've also begun to collect seeds from plants on the property that I think will combine well in arrangements. These test plots will function as founder plots. I will collect the seeds of those species that perform well as I continue to expand the beds and increase the areas devoted to flower farming. I'm selecting species that I think will be successful in the hot, wet tropics. I'm locating these trial beds close to the house so that I can carefully observe how each species performs and be sure that none will present a problem of escaping and becoming invasive. I purchased small plants at the recent flower festival in Ibonito, as well as started seed trays from seeds here in Puerto Rico. Once the land has been prepared, I will combine these first species using techniques described in the book. One of the main approaches that differentiates this style from traditional horticulture or agriculture is the tight spacing and layering found in meadows. There can be 20 to 30 species in a square yard of native meadow. My planting strategy is to sort my plant list by height. I will then place each each species, species scattered throughout the beds, starting with the tallest and working my way down to the shortest until I have a dense layered planting that looks spontaneous yet considered. I will then monitor for weeds and remove those species that are undesirable as the new plantings establish. I will also prune and edit the desirable species to help them weave together and create a diverse tapestry from which to harvest cut flowers. I'm keeping detailed notes on propagation techniques, germination, seed collection, and pollinator and insect observations. I'm delighted to have found a way to include the whimsical spontaneity of a design meadow with the production of organic cut flowers and we'll keep you posted on the results. I'm expecting to learn about the real life challenges and rewards of flower farming in in a meadow style here in Puerto Rico. This is the last word on mini meadow design by Graham Gardner of Tiny and Wild.
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to WashingtonGardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.